Hello, so um, I'm going to conclude uh, last week's lecture with uh, one of my favorite Nobel Prize winner, Joseph Stiglitz. Um, he really uh, moved the way we, we do economics by um, providing uh, new results and uh, contributing to about any field of economics. Uh, he really uh, covers all the topics with a common vision that market imperfections and asymmetries of information invalidate the view that uh, unfettered markets are efficient and justify various forms of government interventions. So, before, um, yeah, be before uh, Stiglitz, economists were aware that uh, information was not perfect, but they thought that uh, the, the ways it was imperfect would not change by a lot the, the results of uh, market efficiency, etc. That it would just be small factors, but actually Stiglitz and others showed that even very small uh, asymmetries of information can create huge distortions and um, invalidate the market efficiency results. For example, under asymmetry of information, a competitive insurance market cannot be Pareto optimal. And uh, um, I will explain why. So this is a paper uh, by Rothschild and Stiglitz, where there are two types of people. Those with high risk, um, so these are the, the, the people who, you know, uh, skydive, uh, drink a lot of alcohol, etc., and uh, low-risk people. And um, the, the, the best insurance contract for the high-risk people is to have full insurance that covers every accident they can have. And the thing is that to offer this contract to high-risk people, we cannot offer the same kind of contract for low-risk people. So in the ideal world, where there would not be asymmetries of information, the insurance company would know the type of each person and offer a contract with a higher cost to high-risk people and to lower cost for low-risk people because on average uh, they will use less insurance. Less um, insurance will have to pay less. But in this world uh, of asymmetries of information, the insurance market doesn't know the type of people on the private information. And if the insurance had two contracts with full insurance with different price, everyone would choose the one with the low price. So um, the, the insurance company would lose money. So the, the way to uh, distinguish uh, high-risk people and low-risk people is to offer the full insurance contract to the high-risk people and to offer only a contract with partial coverage to low-risk people. This way, so the, the partial coverage contract is cheaper, uh, but it doesn't insure 100% uh, of accidents. People have to pay uh, part of the cost below a deductible. This way, those with high risk will choose the more expensive contract with full coverage, and those with low risk uh, prefer the cheaper contract. There is a possible Pareto improvement in this situation where uh, we subsidize a high risk contract um, because those with low risk, they would, they would prefer to have a better coverage. The reason why they are not, uh, they, there, isn't, there doesn't exist a contract with a better coverage for them, it's because of incentive compatibility constraint, meaning that uh, the insurance company needs to know uh, who is low risk and who is high risk. But in principle, uh, they are ready to pay a bit more uh, to have better coverage. And uh, this, uh, this, this cost that they are ready to pay uh, would fund uh, the high-risk contract. 
Um, and this is not, um, so the, 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 the equilibrium is not Pareto optimal because um, in, the, in the competitive equilibrium, uh, there, there cannot be um, subsidies uh, because, um, because uh, uh, of, uh, of the competition of, of firms. Meaning that uh, if uh, some firms proposes a partial coverage contract uh, that subsidizes uh, the high risk type, then another firm can come up and propose a slightly cheaper contract um, with a slightly less subsidy. So uh, this is a, a strong argument in favor of uh, compulsory insurance or, uh, or, or the imposition by the government of the, of the insurance, uh, to the same insurance to, to everyone. So Greenwald and, and Stiglitz extend this result and uh, show that um, market failures are pervasive, they are everywhere, and uh, corrective taxes can correct them. So, for example, those with a high risk, a way to, uh, to avoid uh, that those with, they, they impose uh, a partial coverage on those with low risk would be uh, to subsidize their insurance contracts. But another way, which is often cheaper, would be to reduce their risk. So for example, if these people don't buy a helmet when they ride a bicycle, a corrective tax or a corrective subsidy would be to subsidize helmet. And this can be actually cheaper than subsidizing uh, their insurance contract. Or it can be a tax, you can tax uh, skydiving or uh, motorbikes. Are, these, are there questions on this? It's a, it's a very good paper by them. Um, Stiglitz is also known um, for screening. So, there are an infinite uh, number of ways uh, markets can fail. And uh, one of the contribution of Stiglitz was to find um, a way to, to classify the different market failures. And uh, one, of this one of these market failures is, is screening, which allows a less informed uh, uh, principle, the screener, to extract information and combat adverse selection. So a good example is uh, the hiring process. So the, the firm which is hiring doesn't know uh, the productivity of the applicants and the hiring process, so looking at the CVs, the interviews, uh, helps the, the firm have a better information. This is a basic screening. Uh, having a, a menu of insurance contract, that, as I just explained, is another way because because you have two different uh, contracts, one that will appeal to the high risk and one that will appeal to the low risk, this is a menu of contracts, uh, you get information on who is low risk and who is high risk. Another example is uh, to have different classes of tickets in trains and uh, airplanes, which helps the firm understand who is ready to pay more. But screening is not always possible. And asymmetry of information can lead to various market failures, for example, credit rationing. What is credit rationing? It's when the credit market doesn't clear. So the equilibrium rate of interest is too low, meaning that at a higher rate of interest, of course, more people would, would be ready to, to, would be willing to, to lend, but you would also find uh, as many people who would be ready uh, to borrow. Why is that so? so? Because, according to this theory by Stilitz and Weiss, raising the interest rate attracts riskier projects. Because, basically, when the interest rate is, is, uh, is 20%, it, it demands a very high risk, so uh, if you have a solid project with only a 5% return, you will not borrow at 20%. And those risky projects 
there may be such a high rate of default that it's not profitable for, for, for the banks to provide uh, loans at such a high equilibrium rate. They would prefer a lower rate of default, uh, and so they propose low, lower rates. Um, and so this is a possible explanation why in low-income countries uh, the, the credit markets are so uh, tiny, uh, despite uh, uh, various, so that there are many uh, um, profitable projects that cannot find funding uh, because firms uh, find it more profitable to have uh, a lower interest rate and, uh, and there is a maximum amount of, of funds that they can lend. So uh, some projects get randomly selected and some others uh, are not funded. Um, so apart from uh, contribution to, to theory, because uh, Stiglitz is a theorist, he is really involved uh, into politics. Uh, he was the, the principal main economic advisor for, for Bill Clinton for a while. He was uh, the chief economist of uh, the World Bank. And he wrote many uh, very good general public books, uh, which actually you, you can take one of the book as a, to summarize uh, for, for, for a topic for a critical summary. He also uh, wrote a report uh, for the United Nations or other big institutions, like a report on how to reform the international financial system, a report on the carbon taxes, a report on how to measure uh, prosperity. Um, among his political positions, there is a strong criticism of uh, austerity measures, uh, like the one imposed by the IMF, uh, which, is, which are known as the shock therapy, or uh, the Washington Consensus. So when, uh, the, when a country has a high, faces a high uh, interest rate on their sovereign debt, they turn to the IMF to obtain uh, loans at a low rate. And then the policy of the IMF is to provide the, the loan under uh, some conditions. The conditions being that the country liberalizes uh, their economy, so uh, deregulates, privatizes uh, companies, uh, decreases public spending, uh, decreases taxes like uh, tariffs, various measures. And uh, many economists like Stiglitz are critical uh, about uh, these measures. And uh, actually, um, so to give an example, in the Asian crisis in the, the 90s, so the, the, it, it was a pure financial crisis uh, that, uh, that, that led uh, some countries in Asia uh, with, um, with problems in their sovereign debt and uh, with their uh, exchange rate. The solution of the IMF uh, was uh, to, to cut subsidies on food, to, uh, to, to cut uh, uh, public pensions, etc. And um, it was not related exactly to, to the cause of the crisis. And uh, in, in some countries like uh, Korea, Thailand, unemployment uh, tripled in, in, uh, in a few years because of austerity measures. In Indonesia, there were food riots. And uh, Stiglitz um, used his uh, position as the, the chief economist of the World Bank to uh, starkly criticize these policies. And uh, in particular, when they wanted to apply the same policies to Malaysia, uh, Stiglitz convinced the, the IMF to, to not do it in the end. He also criticizes the, the euro system uh, in, a, in a book, um, saying that uh, the, euro, the, the, the way it is designed uh, cannot prevent uh, macroeconomic imbalances uh, of trade balance. Actually, I talk about it at the end of this lecture, trade balances. And, uh, and it lacks a, a common economic um, policy. Uh, a coordinated economic policy, uh, like uh, a common unemployment insurance, for example, that would uh, help to, to, to stabilize 
to, to, to rebalance uh, countries that uh, cannot use their monetary policy anymore um, and to to, to redire redirect the, the surpluses of uh, exporting countries like Germany to, uh, to importing countries like, like Spain or Italy. And um, yeah, so, so he thinks either there should be a stronger uh, integration within the Eurozone, but he thinks that it is unlikely. Uh, to a certain extent, history has proven him wrong because uh, last year with the COVID crisis, we've seen uh, much, much stronger uh, solidarity with the uh, European countries. Uh, and he said that if it's not possible to have a more coordinated uh, Eurozone, then uh, many countries uh, in the south of Europe would probably be better off uh, by leaving the, the Eurozone. Um, and he promotes also uh, various policies, redistributive policies, so redistributing income and wealth, uh, many types of regulations, for example, uh, to regulate the financial system. And uh, he also produced the Henry George theorem. So Henry George was uh, a famous economist at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, like his book was a bestseller. And in his book, he advocates for a location value tax. Yeah, and, and all economists agree that indeed it would be the best tax possible. So the tax would be a tax on the value of a location. So instead of taxing a building uh, because of the, what, it, what the building is worth, the building is, is worth, um, I mean, you, you tax only what the location is worth. So, so you would tax the same, uh, you'd pay the same tax for a uh, thousand meters square of empty, uh, uh, empty uh, spot in, in the center of Zurich than um, the same spot with a tw 20 uh, floors building. The value of the of the tax depends on the value of the location, so uh, it would be higher in the center of Zurich than in the suburbs. Uh, it would be higher in uh, in uh, agricultural land uh, that are, have a good um, uh, good um, conditions than in uh, agricultural lands with uh, poor conditions. But it will not depend on the investment that has been done on the on the part on the on the slot on the spot doesn't depend uh, on whether uh, there is a building or not, for example. Uh, the fact that it doesn't depend on the investment uh, <coughs> implies that there is no problem of incentives. Okay, uh, th because if you tax the value of the building, then uh, it discourages investors to, to, to build uh, something in the first place. Um, and uh, it's also taxing something that you cannot avoid because you cannot um, uh, move your land uh, to a place uh, where uh, the taxes are lower. It, it, it must stay there. And uh, we say that the, the tax base is inelastic. Um, it also uh, serves to... Um, to tax, um, I mean, to the, the highly um, popular zones, areas, uh, which are also our richest areas. Uh, so it's a tax on, on rent as well. It's uh, because you, you are somehow lucky if you happen to, to own uh, an area uh, that is well located. Um, so some economists go as far as saying that we could replace all taxes with this location value tax. This is not what, uh, what Stiglitz says, because uh, probably you cannot uh, uh, collect enough uh, revenues uh, from this, but, um, but, but he says that we, we should tax it. Uh, uh, it should be an important component of the tax system. Are there questions about Stiglitz? About all what I've said? Yes? So it seems he's quite uh, left-leaning. Yes, he's very left-wing, yeah. Um, he's, he's, he's very uh, left-wing, but uh, his, his contribution to economic theory are very mainstream. 
uh, it's, it's really neoclassical economics, uh, widely accepted by economists, and, uh, and, and is, um, so it uses economic, like mainstream economic arguments uh, for, for, to defend its left-wing uh, point of view, yeah. Any other question? No. Okay. Um, yes? What does he do now? Now, uh, so he's professor at Columbia University, and uh, he doesn't have a special, uh, so he still writes reports, papers, uh, intervenes in the media, but uh, no, nothing special. No. Yeah. Um, it's quite, it's still active, like he's more than 80, but he's still active. Um, so, um, now turning to uh, efficiency wage, which is a, a theory uh, developed by Stiglitz and Akarov and Yellen. Um, so, why did uh, Henry Ford doubled his workers' wages in uh, 1914 from uh, 2.5 to $5 dollars per day. What, why do you think, like, uh, what, what was the goal of Henry Ford? Was it uh, pure altruism? Was it, yes? I mean, he, he probably wanted his workers to be as productive as possible. Exactly. So, so Exactly, so this is a good response. He, he, he wanted the, the workers to be motivated and productive. Because we often hear that the reason why was he wanted that uh, his workers uh, have the purchasing power to, to buy his car. But uh, it's nonsense because the, his workers is maybe 1% of the consumers, so uh, it, it won't uh, change the purchasing power of, uh, of all the consumers. The reason is uh, efficiency wage. Um, so to limit turnover cost, the, the cost uh, of uh, having to hire and, uh, and, and um, educate uh, new people uh, frequently, and to improve workers' uh, morale, so uh, to encourage workers. So the efficiency wage hypothesis states that the equilibrium wage is above the market clearing wage, meaning that uh, workers, some, some unemployed workers would be willing to accept uh, a job at a lower wage than the prevailing wage. Thus, it explains involuntary unemployment by a market failure, because it is not due, this, um, this non-clearing is not due to, to regulation like a minimum wage or to unions, it just, uh, just comes from the market directly. So why would um, the productivity of workers increase by paying them a higher wage than they would accept. Yeah, maybe uh, you can have uh, some guesses. No, no idea. Yes. Sorry. They have more to lose if they get fired. They have more to lose if they get fired. Exactly. So this is the. Um, the, the, the Shapiro-Stiglitz uh, model that I will explain in a minute. There are other potential models or explanations. One of them, uh, who only works in very uh, low-income countries, uh, not sure it, it, it still, uh, it still applies uh, nowadays, but in the past uh, for sure, um, wage needs to provide enough calories to work productively. Especially when you work in the field as a farmer, you need a lot of energy. And uh, sometimes, uh, if your, your wage uh, is, is too low, uh, it will not, uh, you will not be able to buy enough calories, um, that, uh, the, the calories needed to work. So, uh, so even if you would accept such a wage because you're starving, uh, it would not make sense to, to pay you such a low wage. Um, Another reason uh, brought forward by uh, Akarlov and uh, Yellen is to, um, so Yannette Yellen, who is actually a Secretary of Treasury in the US and former uh, chairman, chairwoman of the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank. So it's to encourage um, the morale of workers through trust, a sense of fairness, and the norm of reciprocity. 
Basically, uh, it's the idea that uh, workers are social uh, animals, and uh, when they, 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 they find that they, they earn a fair wage, uh, when they find that the um, employer uh, pays, you, uh, pays them uh, more than necessary, then they feel uh, ob obliged, in some sense, um, to the, the employer, and uh, they work with uh, more enthusiasm. Uh, it can also uh, be explained by self-selection, because if uh, the average worker applies to everywhere, every firm, but productive workers only apply to uh, high-paying jobs, then the applicants in high-paying jobs uh, will have a higher share of uh, more productive uh, people, and uh, it will be easier to find one. You know, related ways to attract more applicants, uh, which increases your, your chance to find a good match uh, between the, the applicants and your needs as a firm, uh, you, you increase the weight. And then there is the model by Shapiro and Stiglitz, which is called the, the shirking model. Shirking means cheating in English. And this model, a higher wage, acts as a deterrent from cheating. So this uh, explanation, this model, uh, became the most popular explanation uh, in, in macroeconomic models. And it works the following way. If an, employer, an employee is caught uh, shirking, then uh, they are fired. But uh, it's costly for firms to monitor uh, whether workers shirk or not, but uh, they do it from time to time. So firms offer high wages. This creates unemployment because uh, the, the labor market doesn't clear. And uh, this was your explanation. Uh, unemployment deters shirking by creating uh, by, by a gap between the, the income that uh, you receive being unemployed and uh, unemployed. I mean, there always is a gap, but, um, but by making credible that uh, you can end up in the unemployed uh, uh, position, uh, you, you, you don't want to lose your job and uh, you, you work hard. So unemployed workers in this model, they are willing to work at a lower wage, but they cannot credibly promise not to shirk at such wages. Because if the equilibrium wage, I mean, if the wage was lower, then it wouldn't uh, be a sufficient deterrent. Um, so although there is involuntary unemployment, it is not a Keynesian explanation, because here, Unemployment exists as the solution against shirking, against inform uh, asymmetries of information. And, uh, and so it is optimal in the model, unemployment. So, so it's here that you see it's not uh, left-wing at all what, uh, what he does. Uh, still, it's, uh, this is quite a conservative uh, explanation of involuntary unemployment. Uh, are there questions on this? Uh, yes? So, so the question is, why doesn't Ford, uh, instead of, of, um, of uh, raising wages, would hire more workers? Um, probably because uh, it is more costly to, to have more workers than to have the same number of workers that work more productively. Uh, because uh, the cost of hiring workers, the cost to form them, uh, the, the organization costs to, to have more people. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably, yeah. They, they just found that it was cheaper to do that way, I think. Yeah. Other questions? Yes? So, um, on the last line, so how would, uh, it's written that this involuntary unemployment uh, works against imperfect information. So in what sense exactly is it 
like with that not being able to promise um, to not shirk or Yes, so the imperfect information here is uh, whether the um, employee shirks or not, or not, or not. Um, exactly, and so, and so the thing is that um, if uh, the wage is, is low, there is not a big difference between being unemployed and uh, being employed in terms of income. And so people are, okay, I can just uh, not work, and uh, worst case, uh, I'm, I, I, I am unemployed, but it's not that bad. So uh, to act as a deterrent, um, unemployment uh, must be uh, higher. So the, the, um, so the risk of being unemployed must be higher. Uh, no, and the, um, oh, sorry, the risk of, the, 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 the difficulty of finding a job when you, when you are unemployed must be higher. So the unemployment rate should be higher, and the gap between the income uh, should be higher. Yes? Maybe what causes it, I suppose, can't be done today. Huh? Sorry? I didn't... As in, what, what Ford did when he doubled the wages, could you still do that nowadays? Okay. The question is, uh, so Ford doubled the wage uh, in the beginning of the, 19th, uh, in the 20th century. Why, sh why wouldn't do, why do don't, don't we do it the same today? Um, it's a good point because uh, the, the point you raise is because like before he did this, uh, the situation was suboptimal in a sense and uh, he corrected, made it optimal. So the question is, uh, is the situation optimal today? If not, why, uh, why, why don't we like switch to the optimal uh, solution? And, and at his time, why was uh, why why was it not optimal before? Um, so I don't know uh, the, the the answer. Um, and I don't know also if today uh, wages could be um, could be increased uh, in the way that is uh, beneficent for the firms or not. It probably depends on the country and the sectors, etc. And there are probably examples, I think, for example, Amazon pays $15, so it's higher than the minimum wage in the US. Uh, so there are some firms that, uh, that pay more than they could. Uh, yeah. You have to be large enough to change the market clearing rate. You have to be, uh, you have to be large enough to change the market clearing, although in the shirking model of, um, of Stiglitz, uh, Shapiro and Stiglitz, uh, each firm uh, is better off to to apply the, the, the to, 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 to give a high wage, even though it's uh, decentralized. Um, why is that so? Uh, because uh, if they pay a lower wage, then they cannot be sure that their employees uh, do not shirk, basically. And, uh, and if we think more broadly, uh, for Ford, uh, yes, so he didn't uh, change the, the, the whole labor market, uh, but uh, it, was, um, it was fine because uh, it, uh, it improved uh, workers' productivity. I think, yeah, it's a good transition to the next point. Empirically, the good explanation is probably not the one of Stiglitz, it's probably the one of Akarlov and Yellen. So, uh, so empirically, we observe efficiency wages, uh, so higher than the, the market clearing, and the best explanation seems social norms of fairness, and this is probably uh, why uh, the productivity increased uh, with Ford, and so he didn't need that uh, to change the, the market conditions. He could have hired people at a lower wage, but uh, it improved his worker productivities to do so. Um, so these social norms explains the, um, the wage compression that we observe, that the wage compression is that within a firm, uh, the, the, the wage scale is reduced compared to um, the sector in which this firm evolves. Or if you take one sector, the firm, the, the wages are, are more similar within that, that sector. Um, then, uh, I mean, there are, 
rather no, the, the wage compression is what I explained and then there is another effect which is the differential across sectors so for people with the same uh, skills uh, say you graduate as um, in, in business uh, whether you you work later uh, in an NGO or in a bank you will not earn the same wage and uh, this, this is not uh, explained by uh, Neoclassical by, by the benchmark theory because the benchmark theory uh, the worker uh, should 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 be paid at their productivity and it doesn't matter that productivity only depends on their skill. Um, the reason here is that um, uh, there is it's the, the way people perceive fairness. They compare. Uh, they, 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 I mean, they compare uh, their wage to, uh, to the wages of others, but mostly to uh, their peers. So uh, people from their own firms. And uh, they, they find it unfair where, when there, there is a big uh, dispersion of wage within the firm, which explains the wage compression that we observe. And, um, and they also... Uh, yeah, it also, uh, the, the, this, this fair wage uh, effort hypothesis also explains the, the differential uh, between sectors because um, if, uh, if say, so the, 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 the one with a business degree would be paid the same in an NGO uh, than in a bank, but uh, in a bank, there are only uh, skilled, uh, I mean, highly educated, highly paid people. And in the NGO, uh, there are also uh, contacts with, with poor people, there are um, benevolent uh, workers, etc. Then uh, they, it would feel more unfair in the NGO if some are paid a very high wage. Um, so, so this this norm of uh, this, this view of fairness uh, explains uh, why workers expect a certain wage, which differs uh, among by sectors and by firm, and uh, that they they don't work productively when they find it unfair, for reciprocity reasons. Other questions? Okay. If, yes. The what? The uh, globalization. So you have like all the high income earners in California and all the poor income earners in the company globalized in China. So the question is um, can uh, the, the link with globalization and, uh, and indeed, uh, as you said, um, like uh, you. you you, you cluster all the high-wage uh, people in the Silicon Valley and, uh, and uh, far away from uh, those who build the, the, the phone uh, in, in, in China. And, um, and, uh, and this and so globalization can, can explain then also uh, why we have this uh, differential and wage compression. Is this your point? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, yeah. This is totally true. Uh, people uh, are much more aware of uh, inequality uh, that are next to them, and much less about global inequalities. So, uh, so, 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 workers uh, in China uh, would be uh, probably more. Um, uh, annoyed uh, if uh, their co-workers uh, earn like uh, five times uh, as, as they, as them, more than they. Um, I mean, they, they will be much more annoyed by local inequalities than by the fact that in the Silicon Valley, uh, people are paid a hundred times more. Yeah. Yes, I think we can make the pause right now. Um, various fields in economics that um, 
yeah, there, there are more fields than sessions, so I have to put uh, different uh, topics in the same session. Uh, this is the case here. So these are like largely unrelated things, uh, but I, I put them in the same uh, lecture. And actually, I think I won't follow the order um, there because I won't have time to cover everything today. I will start by the end. I will start by uh, trade. Oh, maybe. Okay, now maybe I will start by um, by search. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I will do um, search and matching. Then I will do uh, probably trade, and I leave uh, the rest for uh, next session. So, um, Peter. Uh, so th this this uh, slide is about uh, Nobel Prize Peter Diamond. So. He's a public economist. Public economics is the study of uh, what the government should do, basically. And um, a big part of uh, public economics is concerned with taxation. This is the first part that I'm skipping today. I'll do next week. And a uh, big part is, uh, is labor economics. Or sometimes we say labor economics is separate from public economics. It doesn't matter. Uh, so here, uh, the question is, um, unemployment, and, and Peter Diamond was um, a precursor in the view that is most uh, commonly accepted, the mainstream view of uh, the labor market of unemployment by economists. But um, let me start by another thing uh, that uh, he did with James Merlis. Um, so it's a result they, they, they showed that uh, because uh, it would uh, reduce uh, the efficiency of production uh, to, do, to do it, uh, the government should not tax intermediary goods. So if you, buy, if you, build, if you manufacture a car, you need steel, okay, uh, raw steels. Uh, no one buys steels for their own consumption. It's an intermediary good. And their result uh, shows that uh, these types of goods that are only bought for firms to produce other goods should not be taxed. Uh, then uh, Atkinson and Stiglitz show uh, related results that um, if you have, uh, as a, in your uh, toolbox as a policymaker, uh, nonlinear income taxation, so you can tax income uh, with uh, any rates you want. Then you don't need to tax commodities. So commodities is the car in the example I just gave. It's the final goods. Okay. So uh, Atkinson and Siglitz showed that uh, um, in the general case, uh, commodities should not be taxed, or if they are taxed, uh, they should be taxed at the same rate. So it should be the same tax for uh, cars, for food, for uh, computers, etc. And indeed, this is what we see. Uh, the value added, added tax, uh, the VAT, is the same for every product. Uh, so this um, is because the, there is uh, two goals of taxation. The first is to fund uh, the public budget. Uh, and the second is redistribution. Redistribution, you can do it uh, with the nonlinear income tax. So by, by choosing the, the, the income tax rates, you can achieve uh, any income redistribution you want. If you want a lot of redistribution, you put higher taxes on the rich and vice versa. And to fund the public budget, you can uh, have uh, a flat uh, uh, on top of the, of the nonlinear income tax, you can have a flat tax uh, either on commodities, the VAT, or on incomes. And um, what they show is if you don't have uh, uh, this flat tax, if you tax some commodities more than others, you will have distortions. Uh, if you tax a computer more than cars, then everyone will buy a computer and, uh, and, and it will be suboptimal uh, because um, it will not reveal the true cost of a computer relative to a car. There are some exceptions to this result. It's when there are externalities. 
So for example, a car, it creates a, a, a pollution externality. Um, so in this case, it's justified to tax the car more. Another uh, exception is the Greenwald and Siglitz result. Then if you want uh, to, to, to have corrective tax to, to solve asymmetries and information problem, then uh, it's also justified. Like you, you would uh, give subsidy to helmets and tax to uh, skydiving. Um, what uh, another exception? Um, yeah, I think that's. I mean, there there, are, there is another exception that I don't remember it. Um, any questions on this? Um, there yes. So, um, according to, uh, to their result, there is no reason to have a lower uh, va va value, value added taxes on uh, basic commodities like food uh, or basic food. And uh, it's a very popular thing to have that, but economically, it makes little sense. Because actually, when, when you look at the statistics, rich people buy more of basic food than poor people is the lower share of their budget, but in absolute value, uh, it's more. So by, by putting a lower uh, tax on these, uh, it's, it's an implicit uh, subsidy to, to rich people. And if your goal is to avoid poverty, then you can just uh, change the, the income tax uh, schedule. So have more taxes on the rich, less taxes on the poor, including um, giving money to the poor. Um, so there can still be some good reasons to, to do that. Uh, the first one is if, for some reasons, you cannot have uh, the redistribution going through uh, the income tax. You have uh, political acceptability constraints uh, that like, uh, the rich accept, uh, that the people in power accept to have uh, lower taxes on food, but, uh, but not uh, higher taxes, on, uh, but not to give money directly to the poor. So then, it's a, it's a, then you do it uh, through, um, through cheaper food, even if it's less uh, efficient. Um, another uh, reason is if you don't know who is poor and who is not. And, uh, and so then you will, uh, you will just help the, the, what, the poor by, by subsidizing what they consume. Uh, if you cannot uh, really observe, uh, if you don't have uh, good statistics, or if uh, some people are undocumented, uh, then uh, to help them, you can, you can uh, do that. For the same reason, uh, if it is easy for rich people to uh, avoid taxes, uh, then it's another exception to the result, then it's a good reason to tax what rich people buy, like art, uh, yacht, uh, yacht, uh, I don't know, uh, space uh, trips, uh, things like that. Um, yeah. And uh, and actually, it's um, this is a, is quite an issue in, uh, in in low income countries like India, for example. India spends uh, five percent of uh, of its GDP on. Um, on uh, measures uh, for, the, for the poor, to help the poor. And the bulk of these 5% is uh, in food subsidies, gasoline subsidies, fertilizer subsidies, train subsidies. So like, basically it's like the, the kind of lower VAT, but here it's even more. It's like they, they, they make the, the, the price of uh, like rice or uh, lower than the market price. And, uh, and this is highly inefficient because it benefits to many people who are not poor. Many poor cannot benefit from it because of uh, corruption in the system, etc. And so uh, there are good arguments to replace these uh, subsidies to direct cash transfers to the poor. Okay, um, so the, there is... Um, a famous book uh, edited by Edmund Phelps, so another Nobel Prize, that um, developed new theories about uh, unemployment. 
in uh, 69 and, uh, and Diamond got inspired by this book and uh, he modeled uh, the search process of hiring, which also applies to, to trading. So the idea is that it takes you time and effort to look for a job or to look for an employee, uh, or it takes you uh, time uh, and effort to, to buy a new flat or like uh, some good that, uh, some good uh, have also this characteristic. This time and effort, the, it means that the trade cannot uh, occur uh, instantaneously, and this is what we call trade friction. And what uh, Diamond showed is that tra trade friction results in multiple equilibria, in the sense that there are different natural rates of unemployment possible. Okay, the natural rate of unemployment, if you remember the first classes, it was the um, equilibrium rate of unemployment. And uh, this, uh, this work by Diamond uh, was meant to uh, destroy this view that there was uh, such a thing that a natural rate of unemployment, because he showed basically that uh, any uh, rate of unemployment could be an equilibrium. There are multiple possible equilibrium, and in general, uh, these equilibria are inefficient. The only efficient equilibrium is the one with the lowest possible uh, unemployment rate, and uh, it's often not uh, achieved. Uh, to show uh, this, he used a model that. Uh, we call the coconut model because in the conclusion of his paper, he reinterprets all the model in terms of, uh, of coconuts. And actually, it's more easy to explain it that way. Uh, so the, the coconut model is um, a general equilibria model where the economy can be stuck in a suboptimal equilibrium for lack of aggregate demand. So this is typically a Keynesian, Keynesian model. And it's, it's even more truly Keynesian than the new Keynesian models uh, because um, the lack of aggregate demand is due to coordination failure, so something intrinsic to the market, um, and it's not due to, uh, to rigidity uh, of, of prices and wages like in new Keynesian models. Uh, it's due to uh, animal spirits, to, to the fact that people uh, can have self-sustaining expectations and then when, this expect when people are optimistic about the future, you are in a better equilibrium than where pe people are pessimistic about the future. So this is more uh, what Keynes had in mind than the re wage rigidity explanation. So here is uh, the, model, the model. There are different people on a big island. On the island, uh, there are coconut trees and uh, of different heights. So um, people, to get coconuts, they have to climb, to climb the tree and get the coconut. So they prefer to, to find uh, small trees to get coconuts than high trees. And there is a taboo on the island that people cannot eat the coconuts that they collect themselves. They have to trade uh, their coconuts on the market. They have to sell what they collect and eat the coconut, uh, the, the coconut that they buy. So, uh, and, and there are other trees. So, uh, so they have to, to, to look for a coconut tree, a uh, relatively small coconut tree if possible, and this takes time and effort. Once they have the coconut, there is nothing, another thing that can take time and effort, it's finding a trade partner. And it takes uh, more time and effort if there are few people that have collected coconuts, if there are few sellers in the market. So when there are, few, um, when there are a lot of, of, uh, of uh, sellers of coconuts, when everyone has uh, climbed their tree and, uh, and has a coconut to sell, then the, there is not so much uh, friction to trade, uh, so people can easily sell their coconut, and uh, they know they will find someone. But uh, so, so they, 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 they climb trees as soon as they have sold their coconut, but even if the tree is high, 
But if there are not so many uh, sellers, they know it will take time to uh, sell the coconuts. So uh, when you do the computation of what is optimal, is to spend more time to search for a small tree. And uh, so you collect less coconut um, because um, you will uh, wait until you find uh, a coconut easy to, to, to get. And, uh, and because there are uh, less people who climb uh, coconut trees, there are less coconuts in the market and uh, it's uh, self-sustaining. Uh, there are the expectation that there would be few people selling coconuts. So there are several uh, equilibria level of activity, uh, which can, should be interpreted as uh, employment, natural employment, depending on the expectation about uh, trade opportunities. If people are optimistic that uh, there will be a lot of activity, then everybody climbs and uh, everybody collects coconuts, sell coconuts. If they are pessimistic, uh, then they are very picky and they, they don't climb, climb coconut trees very often. And, uh, and uh, they end up in a, in a low activity equilibria. So business cycles emerge from self-fulfilling waves in optimism. And, uh, and here we arrive at the, the limit of the metaphor in terms of coconuts. Uh, demand, demand activation by the government can change expectations. So, uh, or, or maybe we can pursue the metaphor. Here, demand activation would be uh, the government, uh, like uh, by some uh, magical stuff, they they offer coconuts in the market. Uh, yeah, they offer coconuts in the market. They offer to buy coconuts, rather. Yeah, so the, the, the government offers to buy any coconuts. And, uh, and this, uh, in this way, people know that uh, they will have uh, customers and, um, and it stimulates them to, to work. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the government, government intervention. Um, helps bringing optimism in the expectation. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, equilibria uh, here is characterized by uh, the volume of trade. Yes. And, uh, and we call it an equilibria because uh, people will keep doing what they do. So if they, if they look for uh, coconut trees of uh, at, uh, at most uh, 20 meters uh, to climb it, and, uh, and there are 5% five, uh, five uh, of, of uh, people that are uh, selling coconuts in the market at a given time, then it will continue. And you can have another equilibrium where uh, people will climb any coconut tree and uh, you will have 20% uh, of people on the market selling coconut at a given time. Sorry? There are yes, there are yeah. More trade is a better equilibrium. It's more more employment. So there are there are equilibrium can be ranked in terms of uh, from the worst to the best equilibrium. Equilibrium. And um, this, this paper responds to uh, the island uh, model of, uh, of, of Lucas, of Robert Lucas, so another tropical metaphor. If you remember, this model uh, also used a very uh, uh, simplified um, model to justify basically the contrary that uh, monetary policy was always ineffective, that government should not intervene. And uh, it was, uh, yeah. Okay. Now, the way the, the people, economists, uh, think about unemployment and the labor market is due to a model by Dale Mortensen and Christopher Pissaridis. It's the, 
it's the benchmark model. Um, and they elaborated a search theory that was uh, initiated by uh, Diamond. Uh, so in search theory, it's frictions, so the, 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 the time and effort that it takes to find uh, a partner that prevent instantaneous trades and instantaneous adjustment of prices. They turned this theory into uh, the study of macroeconomic outcomes, such as frictional unemployment, and uh, the theory became known uh, as matching theory when it tackles uh, macroeconomic issues. And um, the, the, the big textbook in this, uh, that explains all this is uh, due to Pissarides, equilibrium under unemployment theory. In their model, you have a matching function which gives the number of new jobs at a given period, depending on the number of unemployed people and the number of vacancies. So, and, uh, and the higher the unemployment, the higher it is easy to, to find uh, someone to hire, so the higher the, the number of matches, and the higher the number of vacancies, uh, also, um, the higher the, the match is, because it means uh, there are more uh, firms that are looking for someone. For a firm, having a vacancy, so looking for an employee, is costly. And the, the big idea of Mortensen and Pissarides is that firms will optimize the number of vacancies, so that the cost of having a vacancy equates the value of future employees for the firm. This value is the productivity of the new employees minus their wages. So, um, for uh, a job seeker, there, there, there is a gain to be uh, employed, and this gain is larger, the larger the gap between wage and unemployment benefit. And uh, this gain is smaller where there is a high turnover, so where there is a high probability of separation or of hiring, because then uh, it's much easier to find a new job when you are un unemployed. And um, so in their theory, they, there is a big uh, role to vacancies and, uh, and relatedly to, to turnover. And indeed, there are big differences between countries uh, in the turnover rate. So in the US, uh, there are much more uh, hiring and much more separation at each period than in Europe. I don't know about Switzerland. When I say Europe, it's, it's more uh, yeah, the big uh, European countries because it may be that Switzerland is closer to the US. I'm not sure. Um, and um, so there are, it's, it's, yeah, people um, stay uh, less time in their job in the US, there is more turnover, and um, this makes the, the gain of uh, um, being employed uh, smaller. Uh, and um, and, and we'll see that in the end, the, this turnover rate has a, a big influence on the equilibrium unemployment rate. Uh, in practice, countries with a high turnover would have, according to the theory, uh, less unemployment. So there is a, so the, the second big, big idea of this uh, model. Um, beyond the fact that the number of vacancies is optimized and that a vacancy has a cost, that the cost of the vacancy equals the benefit of having the vacancy, of the marginal vacancy. Um, then the, big, the second idea is that there is a benefit of a match uh, to be split between the, the new employee and the hiring firm. The benefit is due to the fact that the productivity of the worker is higher, uh, I mean, um, 
is um, yeah that, that the worker will, will bring a profit to the firm. So um, and and the benefit is split through a bargaining process, which I don't detailed, which uh, uh, is a Nash bargaining process, so, worked by John Nash. But basically, the the, the idea is that uh, when workers have more bargaining power, they will uh, obtain a higher share of this benefit. Um, for example, in the form of higher wages, or uh, or better work condition, and uh, this higher wages will also imply higher unemployment. Okay, and what can explain higher bargaining power of worker? It's, uh, for example, the cost of separation for the first from the firm. In, the, in countries like France, uh, it's very costly for a firm to, to fire a permanent worker because they have to pay uh, something, like it depends, but uh, sometimes uh, one year of salary uh, to the guy that they fire. In the US or in Switzerland, uh, it's, it's costless to, to fire someone. You don't have to pay penalties. So workers have more uh, bargaining power when uh, they cannot be easily uh, fired. They can, uh, um, yeah, um, because um, higher firing costs also imply higher uh, hiring costs uh, for firms. They will not easily uh, hire someone if they know that they cannot easily uh, fire them uh, if uh, the business condition change, if the person uh, turns out not to be a good match, etc. And um, yes, and so in the end, equilibrium uh, will um, be lower when wages are higher, and uh, uh, yeah, employment employment will be lower. Uh, when wages are higher, um, it will be uh, okay. Here, I think there is a typo because employment um, should be higher uh, when there is a high turnover because um, because um, because high turnover uh, relates to low bargaining power of, of workers. And um, an employment will be higher uh, if the job market tightness is higher. And this is measured by the ratio between the unemployed people uh, over the, um, I think there is, yeah, I think I didn't update the slides, uh, the last thing here. Because the job market uh, tightness, it's, it's actually the, the reverse. It's, um, vacancies over unemployment. And, uh, and, the, and, yeah, and employment is increasing in the job market tightness. Yeah. And uh, so this, this model was, uh, was criticized. Uh, and there, is, there are some debates in the, in the profession to know to whether it's a good model or not. It's, it's still the most widely accepted, but uh, it fails to account for a number of uh, facts that we can observe. Uh, I will just mention one, which is uh, crisis. So unemployment volatility. So this model can explain why, uh, for structural reason, there are more uh, employment in some countries than others, but it cannot explain what, why there are so, um, so many variation in employment. According to the model, it should be smooth, and there, there, should, like, there, there shouldn't be a large raise, rise, uh, increases in unemployment uh, in, during recession. There shouldn't be a recession, according to the model. OK, are there questions on this? OK, sorry. Sorry for the typo. Now let's go to trade. So, um, Bertil uh, Olin is known for the Eksher Olin model. <coughs> <coughs> oh, 
which is a benchmark model uh, to explain uh, why countries trade and which country will trade and what will they trade. The historical model of trade is a Ricardo theory of competitive advantage that we can also uh, date to, to Adam Smith, which states that a country will sell the good that uh, they are good at producing, meaning that um, they have, uh, yeah, they are more producing, productive at, at producing it. But what makes it what makes a country relatively more produce, productive to produce a good? Do you have ideas? Yes? Uh, how skilled the workforce is. How skilled the workforce is. So this is uh, the extra all in uh, explanation that you just gave. Uh, it is not the original explanation by Ricardo. The original uh, explanation was technology. The idea was that, um, and it was actually true uh, at his time of Ricardo, there were some countries that were in advance in the industrial revolution, like uh, uh, England, that, were, that was the factory of the world, and, uh, and some others that lacked the technology uh, who provided the raw materials. But for Eksha Olin, there is a, another reason. It is endowments in the factors of production. The factors of production is what is needed to produce something. Uh, so labor, capital, or land, typically. And in labor, we can distinguish skilled labor or unskilled labor. So of course, the, the two matters, uh, technology and uh, the endowments in the factors of production, but in the extra earning model, they will focus on uh, endowments in the factor of production and assume that both countries have the same technology. And the idea is that, um, say you are a country with a lot of land, like Brazil, then uh, the cost of, uh, of producing uh, grain, like uh, soya, uh, will be lower. So, um, uh, people will buy more uh, soya in Brazil, and Brazil will, will, will sell more uh, soya to, to other countries. And, uh, and they, in Brazil will buy uh, those goods that are uh, made by factors of production that are lacking in Brazil, say uh, capital, for example. I don't know. Okay, so in this, in the in the original version of the model, in the simplest one, uh, it's a 2-2-2 uh, model. In the sense that there are two countries, A and B, two goods, one and two, and uh, two factors of production. Um, but here, uh, in this graph, you, you don't, uh, show, we don't show the factors of production. Let's concentrate on uh, this curve which is the production frontier of product A. Okay, for, forget about the other curves right now. So product A can either produce uh, this amount of good one and zero amount of good two, or it can produce this amount of good two and zero of good one, or it can produce any amount that is here. And uh, the efficient production frontier uh, gives the, um, the maximum amount of good two that uh, the country A can produce for a given uh, amount of good one. You see that uh, country A is better at producing good one than good two, because uh, the amount of good uh, one they can produce if they don't produce of the other is higher. So at autarky, um, yeah, okay, and the, the, the orange curve are the indifference curve of the utility function, meaning that any point of this, uh, of this curve uh, represents what uh, country A would consume and would bring the same utility as any other point. This uh, higher indifference curve is uh, also 
would also uh, give the, the same level of utility for each point of the curve, and it's a higher utility level than this one. And you see that this uh, higher utility level cannot be attained in autarky. Uh, in autarky, the highest utility that can be attained is given by this indifference curve, and it is at this point, that is the point of tangency between the indifference curve and the efficient uh, the, the production frontier. Now, pro, uh, country B is the exact symmetric of country A. So they are better at producing good too, and uh, in autarky, they will uh, produce and consume uh, this. The same uh, utility as country A. Now, let's uh, country trade. Then it can be showed that uh, uh, they can produce uh, anything that's on this line, and at the optimal, each country will consume the same, CA, which will provide them a higher utility than in Autarchy, and each country will produce uh, this, uh, or PA or PB, so when they trade, they will specialize in the good they are better at producing. They will produce more of, uh, of, uh, of good one for A and of good two for B. Is there a question? Okay. So, uh, so yeah, so countries export the product which use their abundant and cheap factors of production and import the product which use the scarce factors. And the assumptions are identical technology, although this can be relaxed, then you would have a, a mix of uh, Ricardian effect and uh, Ekshaolin effect. Uh, factor mobility only within countries, because if countries uh, are, if migration is possible, if capital can move from one country to another, then, um, this, will, this can also occur, and uh, each country, uh, the, the production, uh, efficient production frontier will move, and uh, each country can produce uh, what they need in, in autarky uh, by, by, imp by importing the, the factors of production instead of the final goods. Uh, then there is um, constant returns of scale, which is the, the crucial assumption that was relaxed by uh, Paul Krugman, and I talked about uh, the, the, the trade, uh, new trade theory initiated by Paul Krugman in a previous session. Uh, with increasing return to scale, uh, then we can explain why countries with the same uh, endowments uh, and the same technology would trade, because of a, a taste, a var var a taste for var variety and also uh, the law of one price. So no transportation costs, no tariffs. You could accommodate from, from them, it's not a big deal. We just reduce the advantage of trading. This model implies the factor price equalization theorem, which is that wage and returns to capital would converge across countries. So this is, this is uh, really unrealistic. I mean, this is inconsistent with reality. We don't observe the same wage uh, in, in countries, although uh, countries uh, try, uh, trade a lot. So this shows that there is something missing in the model. Uh, so this model is highly simplified. There is no unemployment. Uh, capital is, uh, is modeled in the usual, uh, very simplified way, in the sense that uh, it is endowed, it's not uh, produced by accumulation, and is homogeneous, like uh, any kind of, of capital good is, is, is uh, substitutable. Um, yeah. Any question on this model? Yes? Yes, uh, why does it uh, entail uh, factor price equalization? Um, so, so this is because um, so say uh, in, in country A, uh, in autarky, 
the wage uh, would be low and the uh, returns to capital would be high because uh, country A has a lot of workers but not a lot of capital. In country B, the contrary, the wage would be high and the returns to capital would be low. Now, if they trade, country A will be asked uh, to, to, to engage more workers uh, and, more, uh, and less capital. It will, be, uh, it will uh, specialize, specialize in the labor intensive uh, sector and uh, because the demand for labor will increase and the uh, de demand for capital will decrease, this will push the wage high, higher and it will uh, decrease the returns to capital. And this will do it in such a way that the two are equalized uh, between the countries. Uh, to, to really prove it, we would need to go through the equations. So uh, I, I let you search that uh, by yourself. Another question? But it was a good question because I didn't explain it yet. Another question? No, okay. Bertil Olin was part of the Stockholm School, which uh, in the 20s extended uh, weak cell uh, theory, so another from the Stockholm School, uh, in a fully fledged macroeconomic theory, which, uh, which could have been the Keynesian theory. I mean, it was uh, 10 years, or maybe not 10, but a few years before Keynes, and uh, was basically the same theory, but, uh, but not as famous as Keynes. He was a leader of the People's Party for 20 years, which um, was the main opposition party to the Social Democratic Party. And actually, another Nobel Prize, uh, Gunnar Myrdal, um, was a big member of the Social Democratic Party. And um, he was uh, an advocate of uh, free trade and uh, wrote a report that uh, was the basis for the Treaty of Rome that launched the common market of the European Union. In this uh, report, he argued that uh, there was no need to harmonize the, the level of labor standards, like unemployment benefits, social uh, protection, um, uh, social security uh, across country and rich countries shouldn't fear the competition of uh, low-wage countries because, according to him, the reason why uh, wages were higher in, uh, in high-wage countries is because uh, there, there was a higher productivity and uh, this will be maintained uh, under free trade. And uh, this, would, this, is, uh, this is more or less what happened, actually. Uh, there is yeah, there was not a lot of convergence between uh, European countries to some extent some but uh, yeah um, now another uh, trade uh, theorist uh, James Mead and another uh, old uh, Nobel Prize uh, I mean one of the first Nobel Prize uh, he expanded Canadian models to include uh, m multiple countries because in the basic uh, Keynesian uh, view model, there is the clo closed economy, there is one country. But uh, Jens Mead um, was wondering whether uh, Keynesian policies would work in an open economy. Because if the government intervenes to stimulate demand in a closed economy, uh, it would, uh, the demand would be addressed by, uh, low, by national, by domestic um, producers, and it will increase the level of activity of employment. But in an open economy, maybe this additional demand will be addressed by more imports. And so it would just um, uh, be, uh, make the trade balance um, in a deficit and not help increasing employment in the country. So James Mead insisted on the importance of a balance between exports and imports, to not have uh, a too high uh, trade surplus or too high trade uh, deficits. 
he helped building along with um, Nobel Prize uh, Stone double entry accounting. And uh, I will talk a bit about uh, accounting here by explaining how the balance of payment works. So the BOP comprises two things, the current account and the capital account. And it's called the balance of payment because you have this equality, the current account plus the capital account is equal to zero. Both are in balance. So we sometimes hear uh, there is a balance of payment deficit or surplus. It is a misnomer because what it means, uh, it's uh, rather uh, a surplus or deficit in the current account because the balance of payment by definition is always uh, at zero. So the current account is the flow of money in the country, from outside the country to within the country. This flow of money can be due to uh, trade, so it's the balance of trade, uh, export minus import, the so net export. This brings money to the country. Uh, it can also be due to uh, net unilateral transfers, uh, like foreign aid or remittance. Remittances is uh, when uh, okay, you, have, you are Albanian in Switzerland, you send money back uh, to your family in Albania, this is a remittance. Um, and then there is the capital account. So the capital account explains what uh, do the, the agents in the country have, uh, uh, do with this flow of money in the country. There are several possibilities. Maybe they do nothing, and then it adds up uh, reserves uh, in foreign currencies in the central bank. Okay, why in foreign currencies? Because if you have uh, an inflow of, of money in your countries, it means that uh, foreigners try to bought, have bought things from you. So they have bought things in your own currency but uh, using their own currency to buy it. So they had to purchase your currency in the exchange rate market for, before that. And so um, typically the exchange rate market, it works, uh, it's, uh, the central bank uh, is, is a central uh, actor. And so um, if uh, more money is needed uh, by uh, importers from abroad, then uh, the central bank will create uh, the domestic currency, give it to the importers in exchange with their currency, and their currency will add up to the reserve of the central bank in foreign currency. But uh, this is in case no one in the, in the country uses the money that, uh, that uh, has arrived, but they, they could, or use it uh, domestically, but they could instead um, invest it abroad, this, this new money. They could uh, purchase bonds or uh, stocks, shares. This is portfolio investment, so they could purchase uh, bonds abroad. Or they could uh, directly buy building and machines abroad. Uh, this is called foreign, foreign direct investment. Firms do that, essentially, when they build a new plant abroad. Uh, so this is the, the capital account, which gives the... Um, the assets uh, purchased abroad uh, in net, or uh, so minus the, um, the domestic assets sold to uh, foreign people. Now, this is uh, uh, flows, what I've just described. Uh, it means it happens at a given period, the current account, the capital account. And uh, how does this flow materialize into stocks? Uh, this is given by this equation. So the net external position, uh, which officially, I mean, the economists call it the net ex external position, but uh, uh, the official accounting term is net international investment position, is the difference between external assets and liabilities of a country. So it's everything that people from a country own abroad 
minus this thing uh, of the country that are, that are owned by foreigners. And it evolves according to the current account equation. So um, when money flows in the country, it is used to purchase assets externally, including reserves in the central bank. And the net external position increases. Oh, nine. OK. Um, how can I do that? Uh, let me check if I, yeah, I can, I can finish uh, without, uh, without the um, beamer. Are there questions on this? Um, yeah, let, okay, let me forget about the last two lines and, uh, and see you uh, next time.